OK, this week we're going to finish talking about relative clauses. Uh, and let me just tell you right now. Today will probably be the hardest lesson this semester. We're going to cover many different concepts related to relative clauses. So I hope you got your basics down last week. Let's start with the easy stuff. So last week we talked about. That and which. Uh, and you can use that and which to add a relative clause to the subject or object of a sentence. But at the very beginning, I said that relative clauses are for any noun. So what if the noun is not the subject and is not the object? What if it appears in the extra information? Well, then you can use question words as your relative clause function word. And the grammar will look very, very similar to indirect questions. Let me show you. We actually talked about who last time. If your subject or object is a person, you can use who or whom. So for instance, uh, John who called me last night is a good guy. So John is a person. Your relative clause function word can be who. In this case, because you have these two commas, one comma, two comma, um, these two commas tell us that this is extra information. Even if we don't have this middle part, we know which John the speaker is talking about. Now, if the person in the inserted sentence is in the object position, then you can use whom. For example, John, whom I met last night is a good person. In the first sentence, the original version of this sentence is John called me last night. So John is the subject of this inside sentence. But in the second example, the original sentence should be I met John last night because I must be the subject. So John is the object. And if John is the object, you can use the word whom. There's only one kind of sentence where you absolutely have to use the word whom. We're going to talk about that later. But you should recognize what this means. If you see a sentence using the word whom, you should know that this person is the object of the inserted sentence. What? Okay, technically you cannot form a relative clause using what? If you try, it will look like an indirect question. I know what you are thinking. Um, it technically means I know the thing that you are thinking and the thing that equals what? But nobody says I know the thing that you are thinking. People only say I know what you are thinking. And so this is actually an indirect question. Right? The question is, what are you thinking? But if it's not an actual question, you don't have to move. The first part of the verb phrase to the front, so it becomes what you are thinking. Is the. 
um, noun clause introduced by what? So it's an indirect question. This is a complete sentence. Um, what functions as the object of the main sentence? I is the subject, no is the verb. What you are thinking is the object. So there is no relative clause that uses the word what. It just becomes an indirect question. What about when? That was the moment. OK, this is a, a bad example, sorry. Um, I left at noon when lunch began. So in the original sentence, subject is I, the verb is left, meaning to leave, and at noon is extra information. It tells us the time. The second sentence is lunch began at noon. Also, uh, extra information at the back. Um, and the repeated information is the time. Noon is a noun. It is a, a time of day. It is a noun. So you can connect these two sentences using this shared noun at noon. And it is a time. So we connect it using the word when. So this sentence is connecting the two sentences I left at noon and lunch began at noon. And you are inserting lunch began at noon into I left at noon. Now, um, even without this extra information, we know what noon you're talking about. So that's why there's a comma here. Um, I can give you another example where you don't need the comma. Um, I met him the Thursday that school started. So the second half of this sentence, sorry, this should be when. The second half of the sentence says school started on Thursday. The first main sentence is I met him. Um, on Thursday. So it's the same day, it's the same time, so you can connect it using the word when. But in this case, if you don't tell me this part of the sentence, I don't know which Thursday you're talking about. So this is essential information. You do not add a comma here. Now you might start have uh, have started noticing that um, when you connect sentences using relative adverbs like when, the preposition disappears. Because noon is a time, but at noon is the time of the sentence. So the word when doesn't just replace the word noon, it replaces the prepositional phrase at noon. So this when means at noon. This when means on Thursday. You can do the same thing with a place. Well, hang on, one more thing. So, um, right, you can do the same thing with place. So let's see, uh, we met by the lake where the swans live. Main sentence, we met. This is a subject, this is a verb, no object. By the lake is the place. 
The second sentence, the swans subject live verb. No object place. By the lake. So the two places are the same. You can use this shared noun to connect the two sentences. And you replace the location, not just the lake, but by the lake, including the preposition. You can replace this with the word where. Now, in this sentence, there is no comma. So if you don't tell me this part, I don't know which lake you're talking about. But if I do know which lake you're talking about, then you can add the comma. Like, let's say we're talking about a specific lake. And I said, oh, we met by the lake where the swans live. You know that lake. You know it has swans. I'm just giving you extra information. Why? Why really only has one kind of relative clause and you don't really need it? Let me show you. This is the reason. This is the main sentence. I left for this reason. So the reason and the reason are the same. You can replace the second one with the word why. But you don't really need this because you can simply say. This is why I left. If you simply say this is why I left, it becomes an indirect question. Just like what? Right, I know what you're thinking. This is why I left. The grammar is the same. So yes, there is a relative clause using why. And if you see it, you should know what's going on, but you don't actually have to use it. It exists because uh, when you're talking, you may not know how you're going to end the sentence you just began. Sometimes we start talking, but we don't know how we're going to end the sentence. So maybe you're saying something and you're going to explain the reason. Or you, you were not going to explain the reason, but then you decided to explain the reason anyway. So you, maybe your sentence might have stopped at this is the reason, but you decided to keep going. This is the reason why I left. Um, but when you're writing, you don't really need to use the relative clause sentence structure with why. You can just use an indirect question. How is just like what? There is no relative clause structure. Um, so. This is how I drive the original. This is it, it's an indirect question, right? The original question is how do I drive? The indirect question is this is how I drive. And just like what you can expand the word how. How can mean. The way that. And nobody says, I know the thing that you're thinking, but some people do say this is the way that I drive. By expanding one word, how, into three words, the way that, you are emphasizing this idea. You're emphasizing the idea that people drive in different ways, and this is my way of driving. But it's not a relative clause exactly, right? The way that is a relative clause, but how in this way is simply an indirect question. Finally, we have whose. 
whose means it's a person and the sentence that you insert the second sentence is a uh, possessive. So for example, um, Meet my friend Mary, whose dog you saw yesterday. So the first sentence is, of course, uh, meet my friend Mary. That's a complete sentence. The second sentence is you, subject, saw, verb, Mary's dog, object, yesterday. So the repeated noun in the first sentence is Mary. It's a noun. But in the second sentence, it is Mary's possessive soil good. In this case, you can still use a relative clause to combine these two sentences, but you need to use whose. So whose dog just means Mary's dog. OK, so do you have questions about how to use question words to form relative clauses. OK, now that we're done with the easy stuff. The next thing is that versus which. Last week I said in most cases you can use either one, but there are a few rules. And um, I'll give you the two main rules now. This is the best ice cream that I've ever had. In this sentence, you must use that. Anytime you have the best, the highest, the fastest, the only. If there is only one. Or only one group. In terms of the grammar, if there is only one noun, either singular or plural, you must use that. And the second rule. If you are adding extra information. And you tell us that it's extra information by adding the two commas. You must use which. Now, some people think this means you cannot put the word that after a comma. That's wrong. You can put the word that after a comma. You just can't put the word that after this kind of comma. There are many different reasons why you might add a comma to a sentence, but if your comma is there in pairs, right, two commas, to tell us that this information is extra information, after this kind of comma, you must use which. So this is why I recommend that if it is extra information, you always use which. And if it's not extra information, if it is essential information, you always use that. It's easier to remember. There is one more rule uh, governing whether to use which or that, and I'll come back to that rule later because it involves another new concept that we're going to talk about today. OK, next one, sentence switch. We've been talking about relative clauses uh, combining two sentences that share the same noun. But there is one use of relative clauses using the word which that does not follow this rule.
in this sentence. Class ended early, which was great because I had a doctor's appointment. Which noun is this word supposed to replace? The answer is no noun. This which replaces the whole sentence. You can think of this use of which as and this. Class ended early. Well, that's a, that's a bad way to write this. So, you know, yes. Class ended early. And this was great because I had a doctor's appointment. This which represents the entire previous main sentence. In fact, this use of which, which doesn't follow the rules, is very, very common. So sometimes when you're reading something and the author says blah, 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 which blah, 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 and you, you don't know what that word which is supposed to be referring to, maybe it's referring to the entire previous part of the sentence. And it simply means and this blah, blah, blah. OK, next concept. Omissions, and this is where um, do you guys remember in I think elementary school or maybe junior high when you first started learning about negative numbers? Fu shu, zhen fu de fu. In math class, and your brain couldn't really understand what was going on. Like you can add a number, you can subtract a number, but you can also add a negative number. What was going on? This is what this is going to feel like. So we've been talking about how to use relative uh, pronouns and relative adverbs to form relative clauses. So when you're reading and you see the word that or the word which or some other question word, you can kind of see that it's a relative clause. The problem is that there are two kinds of relative clauses where you can omit the relative pronoun. So you have to be able to see that it's a relative clause without seeing the word which or that. Let me give you some examples. And let me give you the full sentence. The man whom I met online was a very nice guy. The main sentence is the man subject was verb. And a very nice guy is the rest of the sentence. The sentence that you put inside is I subject met verb a man whom is the object and then online is the place. So this whom is the object, right? I is the subject, met is the verb, whom is the object. If your relative pronoun is an object, you can omit it. You can do this. The man I met online was a very nice guy, and you should be able to see that this is two sentences put together. Now, some people have trouble seeing that this is two sentences put together. Let me tell you the key. This is a noun. This is also a noun. How can you have two nouns in a row and the meaning of these individual words is the same. That doesn't make sense. English sentence structure goes subject, verb, object. It does not go subject, subject, verb, object. Therefore, this second noun must be the beginning of a different sentence. Therefore, subject, sorry, subject, verb, 
no object in this i met online you need an object right who did you meet online and then you you might you're supposed to think oh the object is the first noun the man and this is a relative clause with the pronoun omitted that's what you're supposed to think you've realized that the sentence grammar doesn't make sense you try to make the grammar make sense and you realize that the sentence is missing a noun then you realize that the missing noun is part of the earlier part of the sentence therefore the only kind of sentence clause where things get moved around like this is a relative clause and therefore you are able to put in the missing word whom or who if you want let me give you another example In this case, you can omit the word that. I love this coat. So coat is a noun. And then you have the word I, which is also a noun. You can't have two nouns in a row. What's going on? It must be another sentence. Subject. Verb object rest of the sentence i'm oh, sorry i've never uh, object this is the more complicated sentence but after the word where you need a noun you need an object for the word where so what are you wearing it's missing this object so what are you wearing? oh it must be the noun that we saw earlier it must be this coat and then your mind goes right right so this one word is being used by both sentences therefore it's missing a relative pronoun now you can only do this if it is ex uh, if it is essential information if you have the two commas and it's extra information you cannot omit that OK, so that's one kind of sentence where you may not see the relative pronoun. There is another kind of sentence where you may not see the relative pronoun. When the inside sentence has the main verb be, then you can omit the pronoun and the word be. Meet John is a complete sentence. It's an imperative sentence. Jesus, Drew, I'm ordering you to meet him. The second sentence, John is my husband. This is also a complete sentence. Uh, so we have replaced the second use of the word John with the word who. John is repeated in both sentences. We replace the second one with a relative pronoun, and so we can connect these two sentences. But you don't, you may not see this part. Meet John, my husband. So there are two ways to explain the sentence. One is that you have omitted the relative pronoun and the be verb. 
The second way to interpret this sentence is that this is an, a positive comma. Let me type that for you. A positive yu. This means that the thing in front of the comma is the same as the thing after the comma. The comma is like an equal sign. John is my husband. My husband is John. Two different ways of understanding the grammar, but the sentence looks and means the same thing. Let me give you another example. Mm. Give me a noun. Can you give me a noun? Mm. Sorry? Bag. Thank you. OK, yeah, I can do this. I left my bag, which was a gift from my mom, at home. In this case, you may not see the relative pronoun and the be verb. The explanation is the same. Either you have omitted the relative pronoun and be verb, or the thing in front of the comma, my bag, is the same as the thing after the comma, a gift from my mom. My bag is or was a gift from my mom. Two explanations for the same sentence. Now, in this case, you can only omit if it is extra information, if you do have the two commas. If it is essential information and you don't have commas, you cannot omit it. Questions so far? OK, two more things. And, we're, and uh, we, I finished the lecture part and we can do the practice questions. OK, so sometimes the shared noun between the two sentences. Uh, in the first sentence, it will be the subject or the object. In the second sentence, it may come in the extra information. Uh, OK, uh, this is going to be a bit harder to come up with examples, but let me let me see if I can do this. OK, the pen that I love to write with has disappeared. So just to review, the main sentence is the pen has disappeared. The inserted sentence is I love to write with this pen. Sorry, this pen. This is great, perfect sentence, no notes. But if you use the word that, you'll notice something has changed. In the, in the first version, the word pen has moved from here to here. If you use the word which, you also have to bring along the word with. So it is with which I love to write. The, the preposition moves along with the pronoun. Right, with has moved from here to here. <clears throat> uh, 
let's see if I can come up with another example. Um, OK, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this version of the sentence, she passed me a piece of paper at Chuan Wo. Is the main sentence. Paper is the repeated noun and the inside sentence is she wrote a message to me on. The paper. But if you use the word which instead of that. Then you have to move the word on also. And in fact, in this case, the sentence is actually clearer. It makes more sense. She passed me a piece of paper on which she wrote a message to me. Like look at the original sentence or the first version of the sentence. The noun and the preposition are so far away. When you see that preposition, you may not remember what the noun was. But if you use which, the noun and the preposition are right next to each other. And the sentence ends with a noun, not with a preposition. Uh, and you can do this for any combination of preposition plus on or, or preposition plus which. We've seen with which, on which, you can you you can do any uh, combination, right? After which, during which, regarding which, all of them work. And if you do use the word which, you have to do this. Questions about this? So if you're reading a sentence and suddenly the sentence uh, has this kind of thing. Again, you should think to yourself, wait, this doesn't fit the grammar. What's going on? Maybe it's the beginning of a second sentence. And then you go on and you see, oh, look, there is a noun. Maybe this is the subject. And slowly you should be able to see that this is a relative clause. OK, last thing. Uh, and this one is kind of fun. It's not hard to understand. It's just kind of fun. Sometimes you will see a sentence like this. That was the Wednesday where we didn't have grammar class. And you're thinking, wait, Wednesday. That's a time. Why does the sentence say where? And the answer is because it's not saying where. It is actually saying where in. Where in means in which. Or you can sometimes say on which. So it's not using place or time. It is using a preposition plus which. It just looks like where. Uh, and this is an, a very old rule of English grammar. If you have preposition plus which, it equals where plus preposition. So um, we just saw with which. This equals where with. We also saw on which this equals where on. You're not going to see a where word very commonly. It's not a very common kind of word. The three most common uses of where plus preposition is where in, where of, and where at. 
in decreasing frequency. So you're more likely to see a where in, you're less likely to see a where of, and you're almost never going to see a where at unless you study the law. But you should know this rule of grammar. So in the future, if you see a sentence where, see what I just did? If you see a sentence where the use of where doesn't make sense, it's probably wherein. Right? So a sentence is not a place. So this is not where. This is wherein. Which again means in which. If you say the sentence in which, that makes much more sense. OK, that's today's lecture portion. In the second half, we're going to do some practice. There are lots and lots of practice questions. Uh, so first, do you want to ask me about anything today? It's a lot of stuff, I know. OK, I know some of you have things to do and you won't be here in the next period. So if you're not here in the next period, please do the practice questions. All the way to page. Where should you stop? Please finish up to page 13. Um, if you have not yet taken back your midterm exams, please come to the front and see me. If you need a handout, I have extra handouts. Let's take an early break and we'll come back after 15 minutes.
All right, let's compare answers for the second half of page one. Number two, three sisters and two brothers. These are people, so it should be who. Number three, our house, comma, as we just mentioned, um, after this kind of comma, right, there are two commas, you can only use which. Number three is which. Number four, who or whom? So is it a subject or is it an object? The next word is a verb. Are all interesting. So this should be a subject, who. If it's an object, the next word should be a noun because you move it from the back of the sentence to the front of the sentence and the beginning of the sentence begins with a subject. Since there's no noun, it should be who. Who itself is the subject of the sentence. Number five, mother and father, who or whom? Both like, like is a verb. So it is also who, subject. Number six, with. Uh, in this case, after a preposition, you can only use whom. This is the third rule of. Uh, third, second, this is the other situation where you can only use whom if it comes after a preposition. Uh, so this functions just like with which, except here it's a person with whom. Number seven, my other brother, person, so it's who. Number eight, favorite sister. OK, but in the next sentence, is it who or is it whose? Fiance, uh, basically her future husband, so this should be whose, her future husband. Number nine. Um, this should be an empty set. The one, right? There's only one, so it has to be that. Um, and because you don't have that, you can't use which, it must be omitted. I am closer to that or whom. You can't use which. Uh, so it's omitted. And number 10, the sister. And the next word is a be verb. It's a verb, it's not a noun. So this is the subject of the sentence. Use who. Questions? OK, next page. We did this one last week. I want to point out a few other answers now that we have more information. For example, question two. Last week we said the answer is, I enjoyed the book that you told me to read, and you delete this extra it. But you can also take out the that because it's an object. Right, you told me to read. Object, so you can say I enjoyed the book you told me to read. Um, number four, last time we said a picture of the car that I'm going to buy. Take out the it, but again, because um this that is a, an object right to buy the car so you can also omit the that you can say a picture of the car i'm going to buy number five well, last time we said delete the about the woman who i was talking about you can also change this to whom about whom 
I was talking and you still have to delete this second about. Or not still, and then you would have to delete the second about. Uh, OK, yeah, those are the alternative answers. Next page. Um, same thing as last time. Each sentence has some mistakes related to relative clauses. Uh, please fix the mistakes. There are 10. I'll give you five minutes.
OK, let's compare answers. Number one, that's a subject I don't want to talk about it. You should see that. There is a missing that right here. That's a subject that I don't want to talk about. So you have moved. This. To the front. So this it. Is extra. Please delete the it. Number two, a person who he writes with his left hand is called a lefty. Who just means he. These two words are the same thing. So this should only be who. Delete the he. Three, our family brought home a new kitten that we found. No it. At the animal shelter. Number four, what is the name of the radio program? To which? Many people listen on Saturday nights. The original sentence is many people listen to this radio station on Saturday nights. So if you're going to move the two, then it must be a which. The alternative answer is to move the two back to the original location. Radio program that many people listen to on Saturday nights. So you will have two prepositions. Listen to on Saturday nights. It looks strange until you remember it's two different parts of the sentence, right? Listen to and then on Saturday nights. You're not actually putting the prepositions together. They're simply next to each other, but they're not together. Number five, the candidate for whom you vote should be honest. Or the alternative answer is the candidate that you vote for. Number six, here's a picture of Nancy. That. You actually cannot use who here because you're not talking about Nancy. You're talking about a picture of Nancy. A picture is not a person, so you have to use that or which. You can't use who. Number seven, people have high cholesterol. This is an important word to know. You should know this word, cholesterol or cholesterol. Should watch their diets, watch what you eat. So it's missing a who. People who have. Uh, again, people have high cholesterol. This is a complete sentence. But then you have another verb, should watch. What's going on? An English sentence cannot have SVVO. Therefore, this must be part of another sentence. Uh, and then you should see that the subject of this part of the sentence is people also. So you have two parts of the sentence that begin with people. Uh, and so the closer one should be missing a who. Because if you put the who here, it's too far away from the shared noun. So the who has to be closer. Number eight, Susie is going to marry the man she has always loved. Know him. You have omitted a whom or a who, or that here. Number nine, there's an article in today's newspaper about a woman who, sorry, that, who or that is fine. The, the problem is she, you don't need this she. A woman that is seven feet tall or a woman who is seven feet tall. You already have a pronoun 
you don't need another pronoun. And number 10, passengers. Who or that? Not which. Passengers who have children may board the plane first. Questions? All right, next page. Page four, this set of questions is only asking you if the information is important or is it extra? Is it essential information or is it extra information? If you think it is extra information, add the two commas in the correct place. That's all you have to do. Add some commas or don't add some commas. Seven questions, I'll give you three minutes. Remember, if the inserted information changes the sentence, the meaning of the sentence, then it is essential. If it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence, if we can still understand what person or what thing we're talking about without the inserted part, then it is extra information. OK, let's compare answers. Number one, the man who lives next door is very talkative. You do not need commas. If you take out the middle part, we don't know which man is being talked about. It's the middle part that tells us which man. So this is essential information. Number two, the book Sarah bought was written by Juno Diaz. Again, no commas. Also, we have omitted the that. So you can't add a comma. According to the rules, you, can, you cannot add commas if you have omitted the pronoun unless the main verb is a B verb and that is also gone. But here the main verb is but, so you can't add commas. 
Number three, Mrs. Ching, comma, whose dog is always barking, comma, is very wealthy. We don't really need to know that her dog is always barking to know which Mrs. Ching we're talking about. It's not like there are two Mrs. Chings and one has a barking dog and the other does not. In any situation that you might find yourself in, there will only be one Mrs. Ching. It's unlikely to be two and only one has a barking dog. So this is extra information. Please add the two commas. Number four, the people I work with all have type D personalities. Again, the that is gone or who is gone, so you can't add commas. Number five, I'm going to guess this name is Yonde. I guess we can check, right? It's a city. You guys want to see how you say this word? Let's check. I'm curious. Cameroon, nice. It's in Africa. Yaounde, great. Yaounde is the city in which I was born. No commas. If you take out this part, we don't know what you're going to say about the city. Yes, Yaounde is a city. So? It's this part that is essential to the sentence, so no commas. Number six, Ms. Voisu, who is a student, is from Romania. Add commas. If we take out who is a student, I'm pretty sure in most situations you will only meet one Romanian person. Unless you go to Romania. Um, so in most situations, you will know which Ms. Voisu you're talking about. So this is extra information. And number seven, Tumba, whose children are very energetic, is always exhausted. Again, add the commas. If we take out that Tumba's children are very energetic, I'm pretty sure you will only have one person named Tumba in the room. It's not going to be very confusing which Tumba you're talking about. So this is extra information. Add the commas before and after this part. Questions? So uh, as I said at the beginning of the semester, Grammar determines your meaning. So in fact, you could not add the commas in number six. You can say Ms. Voisu, who's a student, is from Romania. And if you don't add the commas, you are creating the situation where you have two Ms. Voisus, and one of them is a student and the other is not. Um, so yes, doing this set of questions is slightly weird because you have to imagine a normal situation. Um, but that's not actually how grammar works. When you write a sentence, when you're writing an essay, you will know what meaning you're trying to say. And that meaning will determine whether you add commas. OK, second half, what are we doing here? Same thing except this one is easier. It already tells you which part is the relative clause. Actually, do you guys have color? You do, okay, great. So you can see which parts are the relative clause. So same question, add commas or don't add commas? Number one is no, number two is yes. Three to 10 are for you. Seven, sorry, eight questions. I'll give you four minutes.
All righty, let's get going. Number three. Do we add commas? If we take out the middle part, does it change the meaning of the word rice? It does not change the meaning, so we do add commas. Even if we don't know that this rice is grown in many countries, we know that rice is a staple food. So it's extra information. We add commas. Number four. Does this change the meaning of the word rice? It does. If we take out this part, we don't know which rice you're talking about. So you do not add the commas. Number five. This information changes the meaning of the sentence or not? It does. Right about a man, what man we you have to have the second part to know, so no comma. Uh, one comma possible only, right? The other one is a period, so no comma. Number six, Paul O'Grady, who died two weeks ago of a sudden heart attack, was a kind and loving man. Commas? Yes. You give the guy's full name, you say was a kind and loving man, we know he's dead. We know which person you're talking about. So this is extra information. Add commas. Number seven, I have fond memories of my hometown, which is situated in a valley. Is this essential information? It's not. I. And in this situation, we probably know each other. And so when you say my hometown, there's only one place. So even if you don't have this extra information, we know the place you're talking about. Like if you don't add a comma, this is saying that I have two hometowns. One is in a valley and another is not. Impossible. You can only have OK, so like in some situations you can have more than one hometown. It's not a typical situation. Uh, usually if you are the kind of person with more than one hometown, you probably don't say my hometown. It gets confusing. So this is extra information. Please add a comma here. Number eight, I live in a town which is situated in a valley. Situated just means located. Comma? No comma. Because if you take out this part, I live in a town. OK, cool, so do I. What's your point? The point is that the town is in a valley, so it's essential information. No comma. Number nine, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Comma? No comma. Technically, nobody should be throwing stones, but specifically, this kind of person should not be throwing stones. It is an essential part of the sentence. This is also an English saying. The idea is if you are vulnerable, you should not attack other people. Right? If you can't defend yourself, you shouldn't attack others. So people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones because if other people start throwing stones at you, you can't defend your house. And number 10. Little Red Riding Hood who went out one day to visit a grandmother. But OK, commas. Yes, there's only one Little Red Riding Hood. Doesn't matter what you put in the blue part of the sentence. There's only one character. So it is not essential information. It is extra information. Even if you take out this part. We still know who you're talking about. There's only the one girl. OK, questions about this page.
oh, cool. Uh, the next page is a yes or no. We can do these really, really fast. Oh, there's 16 of them. Uh, I don't think we're that fast. Let's do them together. That'll go faster. Number, uh, okay, so page five. Uh, oh, you also have to add the commas. What fun. Yeah, okay, I'll leave that for you guys to do at home. So uh, this week when you go home, please do pages five to 13. Next week, I'm gonna compare the answers. And if we have time left, we're going to talk about coordinating conjunctions.